Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So this is part two for the lecture of the topic uh, performance. So in part one, we have covered the role governing uh, entire contract or entire performance basically. So now the part two, we are going to focus on substantial performance or the topic is the doctrine of substantial performance. So we need this, uh, the rule governing this substantial performance because why? Um, the law on an entire contract that we have discussed earlier, actually, it has produced great injustice. Okay? Uh, it caused difficulties to the parties like um, the case that we discussed earlier, Carter and Powell. So in order to mitigate the harshness of, the, of this rule, that's why um, the law, okay, I mean the doctrine of substantial performance was developed, was being introduced in order to mitigate in order to elevate all the harshness. So what's the rule? Uh, what's the doctrine of substantial performance here? So the rule governing substantial performance is that okay, where the party to whom the promise of performance was made, uh, performance was made, he received the benef benefit of partial performance. Now here the performance was made partially, substantially of the promise under such circumstances that he is able to accept or reject the work and he choose to accept the work, then in that situation, the promisee is obliged to pay a reasonable price for the benefit received. So whenever the performance is not done completely wholly, and but there was a substantial performance as far as performance was concerned, then um, the other party must pay whatever benefit that, that he has received, even though it's not 100% um, performance. But how do we allow the claim? Because um, even how do you allow the claim in that particular situation? So it must be possible to infer, to imply from the circumstances that a fresh agreement by the parties that payment shall be made for the goods or services in fact supplied. So as if the parties agreed to pay. So we infer or we imply there exists fresh agreement between them for the payment. So this is the case, the landmark case in Malaysia, which discuss about the role of substantial performance. The case is Kunci Rahman and Go Brothers Nurmahat, uh, reported in 1978. Uh, the, the ratio of the case here, it was stated in this case that the doctrine of substantial performance has modified the rigors or harshness of the common law rule. So the case actually um, accepted the doctrine of substantial performance and uh, it reiterated the, the reason why we need this substantial performance rule here. So because of that, a promisor who has substantially performed his side of the contract may sue on the contract for the agreed sum, although at the same time he remains liable in damages in uh, monetary compensation for his partial failure to fulfill his contractual obligation. In that here, he can claim for the amount but then he has, he has also uh, been made responsible to pay whatever amount of damages which is suffered by the other party because of the uh, incomplete performance. But he has done substantial performance on his part. Okay, let's have a look at the facts here. Plaintiff agreed to execute certain work. So plaintiff is the contractor. So what's the work here? To lay water pipes complete with specials and pop. And on the part of the defendant, defendant undertook to supply the pipes. Um, etc. at the site of the work. So whereas a uh, plaintiff was to supply labor or labor and other equipments for laying the pipes. And um, the contract also included work for the reinstatement of a cycle track like in the picture of a size and length uh, and, and at, a, at a rates detailed in the state agreement. So both defendant and plaintiff they have their respective work that they have agreed. Um, so plaintiff need to do that and then uh, defendant need to do that. Okay? They have their work. What happened later, uh, there was problem and then that's why they go, They went to the court all right, for the dispute. So this is their argument. Plaintiff argued that he had performed the work of reinstatement of the cycle track and other works here. But defendant uh, argued that they denied. Okay, they denied that, that the plaintiff had completed the work in question as claimed by him. No, no, you haven't completed the work. And because why? It was a term of the contract that the plaintiff would execute the works to the satisfaction of the defendant and also the, uh, to the chief uh, resident engineer satisfaction who was in charge of the work, of the contract work. But in spite of repeated requests by the defendant to comply with the instructions, plaintiff failed to complete the work as agreed. So plaintiff just 
completed the work according to whatever he likes here. Okay, and then it was not to the um, to the satisfaction of the chief resident engineer and the defendant, even though they have asked him to do uh, to 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 complete the work as um, as per the contract that they have agreed. So because of the plenty failure and refusal to complete the work, uh, the contract work, and to carry out repairs in respect of work already completed. So now the funder had to engage other subcontractors to replace the plaintiff after giving him due notice. Okay, so a repeated request was done actually on the part of the defendant. And then also um, the notice was given to uh, the plaintiff. But still the plaintiff didn't do anything. He just said, oh, I have completed my part. Okay, actually he hasn't completed his work. So because of that, the appointment of other subcontractor here, the funder had to pay the other subcontractors uh, appointed in place of the plaintiff to replace the plaintiff a total of uh, this amount to 22,451 uh, and 44. Uh, and then uh, this is to in order to complete the work and also to carry out the necessary repairs on the work which had been unsatisfactorily completed. In that year, first to complete the work and then whatever work done by the plaintiff, it has to be rectified, repaired. Okay, I mean that yeah, it wasn't done um, satisfactorily. It wasn't done according to, the, to, the, to their agreement actually. So now the issue, okay, before the court will allow the claim, okay, we want to know who is actually at fault here, whether we should allow the claim, okay, by the parties here, the court has to look further, okay, whether the state agreement was a divisible or entire contract, whatever work that they had agreed to do. So uh, upon the uh, uh, screening, upon examining all the terms here, okay, the state agreement was actually an entire contract. But um, as a whole, okay, the doctrine of substantial performance has not been excluded by any express provision. So it's possible to apply the rule of substantial performance in this case. So it will be necessary okay, to examine. So the next step is that okay, we don't exclude the rule of substantial performance. So we want to examine whether plaintiff had substantially performed his contract as he had he claimed that he had done. Okay, he had completed the whole thing here. We want to see whether it was really done or not. And then the court said, this is the ratio, the most uh, the important part of the judgment. The court said, substantial performance is not to be measured by strict financial calculation. We don't have any specific figures in order to see, in order to say, oh, this is substantial performance. Okay? So it goes back to the court. It was for the court to, to consider the defects. Okay? We'll see the nature of the defects and we'll see whether the work was substantially completed. So again, uh, the eventually, okay, finally, it was a question of facts and degree in every case. It depends on the nature of the work. What is the nature? Okay, what's the work that you're supposed to do? So the finding by the court here, plaintiff had substantially completed the contract and he was entitled to balance sum, okay, but subject to the defendant's cross-claim against the plaintiff for the defects and omission in the work done by the plaintiff. Yes, he has done his work substantially, but not wholly, not 100%. So uh, whatever defect he has to be responsible. So defendant can cross claim for the defects and omission of the work by the plaintiff. So the important rule of analysis because the case was also important. So we analyze it and we uh, we extract the rule uh, from the case. Um, it is the first one. It is always a question of facts. Okay, whether a contract has been substantially performed or not. So, and then the court will look at two important um, things here, factors here. The first one, the court will look at the nature of the Defects, okay. How extensive the defect is, okay. It must not fall short, uh, fall short, okay, of the required performance. The defects cannot prevail over the whole completion. And then, what's the cause to remedy the defects here, okay? And it must not be too great. It must be not too. It doesn't really go beyond the full contract price here, as compared to contract. For example, contract price is two hundred k, but the cost to remedy the defect is three hundred k. So in that situation, there's no nothing substantial. I mean, we can apply the rule of substantial performance. Okay? Alright, so we are done with Kunci Rahman, which is very important. And we have the analysis uh, and the rule derived from the case. We have another case, also relevant, or quite similar. Okay, uh, to And also it shows to us application of the rule on substantial performance. Um, Nirwana Construction, Sri Rambahat and Pengarah. Pengarah Jabatan Kerja Raya Negeri Sembilan. 
And this is the appeal case decided by Court of Appeal. So we have the term respondent and appellant. So respondent uh, repudiated the contract because the appellant, appellant was the contractor, they run a construction. The appellant contractor delayed in building the school and also failed to complete the grass turfing of the football field using cow grass instead of hydro turfing. So there are two factors here, okay? Um, why the respondent decided to repudiate, to set aside the contract. Terminate basically the contract here. So the finding by Court of Appeal here, all right, on the part of the appellant, the contractor, they had they had actually substantially performed the contract, and the, the degree or the percentage is 93%, so only 7% not completed. So, and then the, the court reiterated the principle is um, that substantial performance is not to be measured by a rigid financial calculation. It's not actually a figure which is important. We want to see as a whole, okay, whether the work has been substantially performed or not. So again, it goes back to the court discussion. Okay? It is for the court to consider the defects and see whether the work was substantially completed. So basically, the judgment uh, is similar to Kunci Raman. Okay, all right. I, so we just, uh, we are going to continue in the next part, okay? A substance of partial, okay? We are done with um, substantial performance, okay? The, ne the next rule is quantum merit. So we are going to, we are going to uh, discuss in the next part of the lecture. Okay, thanks for listening. I'll see you in the part three of the lecture. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.